Hi everybody, in this episode we're going to talk about the Corpus Hermeticum, which is a really interesting series of texts that are uh, that have a lot to do with Gnosticism and Platonism and Judaism and Christianity and all that other good stuff. We're going to talk all about it coming up on Talk Gnosis. Hi, it's Father Tony here and joining me from sunny Montreal is Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. For one of the first times in months uh, while we've been doing the show, it actually was sunny in Montreal today. Oh, so, how nice. Yeah. Yeah. So it's loyal. Yeah, it's human loyal season. Watchers, now. Oh, sorry. I was just about to say loyal watchers of the show just watch my mood go up and up throughout <laughs> the year and then down. Uh, that's delightful. Well, to talk about Corpus Hermeticum tonight, we have uh, Pedro, and he is going to talk to us about the Corpus Hermeticum and uh, kind of its related traditions. So welcome, Pedro. Thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me, uh, Father Tony. All right, let's get right into it. So tell me about the Corpus Hermeticum. What are these texts? Uh, well, the Corpus Hermeticum itself um, is uh, refers to a specific collection of texts that were compiled in the Byzantine era um, from various other sources. Um, approximately, it, actually 17 treatises, uh, which were compiled by uh, presumably Christian scribes at uh, probably at the 6th or 7th century, which were then rediscovered in the Renaissance era. Um, the Hermetic itself is broader. Um, the Corpus Hermeticum itself is a set of Hermetic texts from various sources, but we also have a couple in the Nag Hammadi Library, which um, there's on the Ogdoad and the Ennead, or the Discourse on the Eighth and the Ninth, um, as well as a portion of the Asclepius, which is another very important Hermetic text. And in addition to that, we have the uh, Anthology of Stabaeus, uh, which was a pagan uh, author of the late uh, 5th century, if I'm not mistaken, who essentially combined a an anthology of classical pagan texts for his son, uh, among which there were a lot of Hermetic fragments, including the Kore Cosmu, or uh, the discourses of Isis to her son Horus, uh, which are a very important uh, set of texts. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the uh, the essential ones. There's also quite a few fragments in the uh, writings of the Church Fathers. Hmm. So these are texts from about the turn of the millennium, from about the time of Christ, and then they... Uh, they're transcribed again in about the sixth century, and then they they pop up again, uh, you know, uh, in the in the early Renaissance. Uh, so it's a family of texts that just seem to keep popping up. What well, mm -hmm. wh where did they come from originally? Uh, well, Greco-Roman Egypt. Um, they the general consensus is that they arose out of uh, the uh, the intellectual climate of places like Alexandria. Um, mm -hmm. Probably, if we were to give a rough estimate, uh, 150 to 350 AD, around that time. Um, and these texts, they vary quite a bit. Um, some of them are more esoteric. Others are essentially attributions to Hermes of common philosophical conceptions or views of the world from around that time. Um, and they, a lot of them survived uh, the whole uh, takeover of the church of the, the ancient pagan world because they, um, they had similarities to Christianity. So they were not seen as a threat. And uh, also pagan philosophy retained a certain prestige um, even into the Byzantine era because it, it's what was being taught in the... Uh, uh, in the schools of rhetoric and uh, the general institutions of the time, so yeah. Right. Are these texts? Are they are they pagan texts or are they Christian texts or are they Jewish texts or they, do they come out of the kind of, you know, uh, Plato schools that we have going on? The Plato fanboys uh, who, who kind of uh, who kind of produces these these texts? Like what what, what is the religious tradition that uh, that that made them? If I were to define these texts, um, they are 
esoteric Middle Platonism tinged with Egyptian religion primarily. Um, they do have some Jewish influence. Uh, for instance, the uh, Corpus Hermeticum One. If you've uh, read it, uh, the whole story of uh, of the light uh, of God coming down on the on the watery ab abyss. Some say that it's a reference to or perhaps influence from uh, the first chapter of, of Genesis, uh, where the spirit of God floated on on the surface of the waters, um, as well as the, uh, the there's a prayer at the end of it, which uh, you may be familiar with, uh, that starts "Holy art thou," mm -hmm. uh, and, and so on and so forth, and uh, the holy uh, that that terminology that's used there is often said to have come perhaps from Jewish influence. However, uh, these texts are essentially pagan. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I find that very interesting, very fascinating, because I feel like today, you know, we set up these arbitrary walls, right? <laughs> this religion is this, this religion is that, but these these texts seem to be kind of resting in a place in between. And uh, as you already mentioned, um, they have kind of a connection to Gnosticism, both because they're drawing on some some different traditions. Gnosticism draws on a little bit of Egyptian paganism, a little bit of Platonism, uh, definitely a bunch of uh, Jewish and Christian traditions. It's coming out of Alexandria. But besides those superficial connections, there's actually some of these texts, some of these Hermetic texts found in Nag Hammadi. Is that right? Yep, yep. Uh, the, uh, on the Ogdoad and the Enead, uh, it's a very important text of uh, mystical ascent uh, to the Ogduad, which was essentially in, in the Hermetic worldview, which was uh, very common back then. Um, the world was divided. Uh, well, you had the Earth, and then you had the seven planes of the planets, beyond which were uh, the Ogduad, which was the eighth level at which divinity began, and then the Ennead. Uh, mm -hmm. after that and this is what they aspired to ascend to and that text is um, is a bit of an astral uh, ascent to that level it has uh, a couple prayers and very importantly um, I think above all in terms of practical techniques um, it has secret names of God uh, which involve uh, the seven vowels were used as mantras, the seven Greek vowels. And this is a, a great point of commonality with Gnosticism. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Sethian texts, such as the Gospel of the Egyptians, um, mm -hmm. I think uh, Trimorphic Protenoia might have some as well, and Marsanes and all these texts, um, the use of names of God uh, or various beings um, as permutations of the seven vowels was a very central thing. And there's a scholar, uh, Garth Fowden, uh, who wrote The Egyptian Hermes, which actually it's uh, uh, one of the books I most recommend on Hermeticism. Um, he actually said that these formulas were probably part of also the Corpus Hermeticum and many other texts. However, they were um, likely removed by Christian scribes who copied the texts because they uh. probably judged them to be a bit too, you know, dangerous or magical. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. I, I have a feeling in the podcast portion we'll, we'll be coming back to uh, mystical ascent. No, nah, <laughs> I'm not very interested. In that. <laughs> <laughs> now, you mentioned a couple of times uh, uh, this figure of Hermes. Uh, Hermes is an interesting dude in Hermeticism. Can you tell us a little bit about who... Uh, who he is said to be and, and all that stuff? Uh, well, Hermes, um, a lot of people uh, connect him with the Greek Hermes as well. Uh, so um, he's essentially a syncretistic figure combining attributes of Thoth, uh, the Egyptian god of wisdom, uh, who was said to have given all wisdom, skills, sciences to the ancient Egyptians, uh, even from back in, uh, back in the... the oldest dynasties and however um, uh, while some people see him as a combination of the Greek Hermes and the Egyptian uh, the Egyptian Egyptian thought uh, excuse me um, he was prime uh, the, the 
the uh, Hermes of the Hermetica, Hermes Trismegistus, thrice great, is primarily um, the Egyptian Thoth personified as a human teacher who is said to have lived millennia before and to have taught uh, a few disciples such as uh, um, uh, Tat, uh, Asclepius, uh, Ammon, and a few other uh, of these figures. Um, if you actually look at uh, the Greek Hermes, he was a very different figure from the more, more somber wise man of the Hermetica. Uh, the Greek Hermes was very much a thief, a god of thieves, of merchants, uh, sometimes a bit of a trickster uh, figure. Um, however, he did have um, uh, connections with communication with teaching. Uh, so uh, there is a bit of syncretism there. However, I would say the uh, the Hermes of the Hermetica is prob probably around, you know, 80% um, uh, the Egyptian thought. Oh. So they, they combine the, these two deities and then, you know, Hermes Trismegistus becomes this teaching figure and the, he appears yeah. in the Corpus Hermeticum as, as the instructor. Yeah, um, there's a very interesting, uh, sorry to interrupt you, a very interesting uh, text I forgot to mention. Uh, it's called the, the Egyptian Book of Thoth, uh, which was actually uh, translated quite recently. It's a scribal demotic text from the first century AD, um, where Thoth is actually given the title of great, great, great in Egyptian. Um, mm. And they finally traced that back that you know the uh, the uh, the title of Trismegistus or thrice great in Greek was derived from that Egyptian epithet uh, given to thought. Yeah, that's very interesting. Uh, it's uh, everybody knows these ideas don't exist in a vacuum, but you know scholarship mm -hmm. can only draw from things that it can actually point to. Exactly. <laughs> so that's that's uh, interesting validation. Um, but let's uh, let's wrap things up here, and we'll talk a lot more about the specifics of all of this stuff in the podcast version. So uh, thank you once again, Pedro, for joining us. And um, let's plug your website for people who are uh, tuning in just now. The Hermetic Federation. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's a long URL. We'll put it down in the <laughs> in the description. <laughs> but can you give us a quick uh, a quick overview of what the Hermetic Federation is? Uh the Hermetic Federation is a collaborative project between me and a few other people, uh, primarily in the States. Uh, we are essentially reviving Greco-Egyptian religion um, as taught in the Hermetica, uh, so very traditional. And we have a, cha a lodge here in Montreal. There's one that's being set up in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania, and as well as Portland, Oregon. And uh, fairly soon in... Uh, Austin, Texas, where uh, I've actually initiated several people, including uh, two, uh, three brethren from Texas, Texas who will be uh, uh, setting it up there. So it's um, based on the Hermetica and the Magical Papyri, which is something perhaps we can talk about later. Uh, yeah. They're also very important texts, uh, closely related to the Hermetica. And so it's a bit of a religious revival um, of this tradition. All right. Yeah, fantastic. So uh, check out that website. Link's down in the description. And uh, thank you once again for joining us. And stay tuned for the podcast. And you can go to uh, agnosticwisdom.net slash talknosis and, uh, and also slash TGAD, I believe, for the podcast. You can subscribe there and sign up. And uh, so you'll never miss any of our content here on the, uh, on the network. At any rate, for those of you who are watching along at home, we will see you next week next week this has been a production of the gnostic wisdom network for more information about this and all of gwn's programming please visit gnosticwisdom.net the opinions expressed in the show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of gwn the apostolic joanite church or any other organization this has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 international license and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons to support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.